Uh, so the, the world needs to wake up. Basically, it needs to wake up and turn the wave. Otherwise, the current um, trend is very dangerous. Yeah, the Uyghur people, 20 million, we may disappear. But the thing is, it's, the whole world is under threat right now from the Chinese regime. The world should recognize it. So, Dr. Erkin Siddiq, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Ah, not a problem. Um, I think, as, as I mentioned before we started, this, uh, this issue is one that needs um, more coverage, and I have been quite shocked at the lack of, of outrage or, or outcry. So uh, I've got you here to talk about the, the Uyghur genocide in, in China. And uh, so why, why don't you start by just giving us an idea of, of, of who the Uyghur people are and um, what, what, kind of, what part of China we're dealing with here. Okay. Um, the, we call our homeland as East Turkestan and the China calls it uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. It lies in the very heart of uh, Asia, situated along the fabled Asian Silk Road. It has been a prominent uh, center of commerce for more than 2000 years. Uh, the land, of East Turkestan gave birth to many great civilizations at various points of history, and it has been a center of scholarship, culture, and power. The current uh, size of our homeland is 1.82 million square kilometers. It is about one sixth of the whole Chinese territory. Um, East Turkestan was invaded by Manju rulers of China in 1759. And in 1876, the Manju Empire occupied our homeland, and in uh, 1884, renamed it, at, at, uh, it as Xinjiang, which means new territory. Uh, in 1949, the Communist China invaded our homeland and uh, renamed our homeland as uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So the, the latest occupation took place in 1949 by, by the Red China. <clears throat> uh, let me see. Yes, that's the current. That's the situation. Okay, so then when did so? I mean, you could go back uh, then to the whole way to well, two hundred, three hundred years with this this part of um, of what is now uh, mainland uh, communist China. So when did when did there start becoming like more than just uh, China occupying the the territory? When did it start to be? Um, when there was deliberate attacks targeted at like the, the local people? Yeah, the, one of the <clears throat> Chinese characteristics is to assimilate. Uh, you can find this um, statement in, uh, in university lectures, for example. I have on YouTube, I can send it to you. It, it clearly states a army uh, lecturer states that uh, Han Chinese main character is to assimilate. Uh, we we keep we assimilate the good races and keep them, and we kill the bad ones, eradicate them. This is what they say. Now, if you look at the official uh, Chinese document and the Chinese propaganda, they say there are 56 uh, minority ethnic groups in China. Uh, but if you look at now, they're all gone except Uyghurs, Tibetans, and some Mongols. The rest have been completely assimilated or eradicated. So the, our problem started right after the Communist China occupied our homeland in 1949. They tried various tactics to assimilate the Uyghur people, but uh, it, it, they were not successful. Basically, one um, the two big factors is the one is our, is our culture. Uyghur culture is very attractive, and uh, also Uyghur people have a very deep root on, on it. Second one is the religion. Because of those two factors, the Chinese government has, been, has failed to assimilate the Uyghur people. So in 2014, Xi Jinping uh, put out a master plan to eradicate the Uyghur people, 2014. If you remember, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, and uh, he worked for two years planning everything. You can find a university PhD student dissertation about how to solve Uyghur problems. He basically adapted some of the uh, measures 
describe it in this uh, research and they put out a plan. The plan is uh, kill one third of the Uyghur population, detain one third of the Uyghur population, and they convert the remaining one third into automatons. Automatons are machines built like uh, humans. So the basically the people speak Chinese and the acts without any resistance, basically receive orders. This is the master plan. I got this plan from, from an official in the, in the central government of China through a middleman. It was very secretive. It's almost not written anywhere. It's verbal, but that was the plan. Now, if you think, if you look at everything else since then, you can understand this whole process. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the right now, the, so the, the Chinese government intensified this eradication process in 2017. In 2017, one year alone, they detained 800,000 Uyghur people. I, I got all this information from a high um, official in Xinjiang government. So after that, they continue to detain people. Uh, you might have heard here and there many aspects of that, like uh, they had uh, 48 uh, reasons to detain people. It's very simple. If you read Quran, you, you got detained. If you pray, you got detained. If you, if you went abroad once in your life, you got detained. If you have relatives abroad, you got detained. In my case, uh, I went back home uh, in 2006, seven and nine, three years. The young people knew me uh, a lot. So because, because my uh, background and my work, I work at NASA, I, I do space telescopes. And the so young people knows me. When I go back in, in those years, a lot of people came to meet with me. We just spoke, sometimes small gathering with the government, the, the government permission. But meeting with me and the communicating with me also became one of the crimes to be detained. So in those three years, I estimate I met about 3,000 students, university students. They all got arrested, disappeared. Uh, so this is the situation. And now, just uh, about uh, two, two weeks ago, I got some numbers also from a um, government official. The latest number is uh, since 2017, the Chinese government have detained 5.6 million Uyghurs, 5.6 million Uyghurs. And uh, they are still in jails and concentration camp. Among them, uh, 1.8 million were transferred from camps to jails. Uh, China had a very rapid process converting, um, trans transferring people from ca camps to jails. Basically gi gives them jail sentences very arbitrarily. This person read Quran five years. <clears throat> This person uh, prays five, five times a day, seven years. This person went to Turkey 10 years. This kind of, you know, they had a look, at, look up table to, kind of, to transfer people from camps to prisons. So 1.8 million people transferred to prisons. In addition, 2.1 million Uyghurs were transferred from East Turkestan to prisons in Han provinces, altogether 19 provinces. So the number is very big. And uh, <clears throat> the, since 2017, more than 800,000 Uyghur people have been killed or died. <clears throat> the situation in prison and, and the concentration camps are very bad. Uh, recently, one, uh, one government official came abroad and uh, told my friend, and my, my friend asked him, what does the situation look like in Xinjiang now? The Chinese calls it Xinjiang now. And he said, imagine a hell and the time is 100, multiply it by, by 100. It is as bad as that one. So the hell time is 100. So that's the situation. And uh, I don't know if you noticed or not, recently uh, RFA uh, published a, uh, some photos and uh, some uh, secret information that in Aksu Prefecture, there are a cremation center between two camps. Uh, I have been telling this that China is killing the Uyghurs in large numbers in a distributed way. They don't took out thousand people into a field and shoot them and bury them. They don't do that. 
they just make it so hard to keep alive. And people are dying, dying at home, dying in prison, dying in camps. And there's cremation centers. If you can, go, you can Google it's a cremation centers, cremation facilities in, in Xinjiang and see what you see. And uh, it, is, it is so horrible. So the number I got so far is more than 800,000 Uyghur people have, have been killed since 2017. And uh, as you know, the China stopped Uyghur's natural, natural growth completely through birth control, sterilization. All the Uyghur females in concentration camps were given some kind of shots or medicines so that they don't have a period anymore. Just they stopped menopause, even as young as 18 years, girls. So no more Uyghurs are born now. It, it stopped completely. And uh, they are stopping it and, uh, uh, in, one, 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 uh, in one hand, and on the other hand, they are killing the people. Just uh, yesterday, I got some information that uh, it is virtually impossible right now to go to hospital and uh, see a doctor for Uyghur people. A couple of months ago, one Uyghur who lives abroad, who, whose, whose mother went into a hospital in Rimchi, told me that the nurses there told her mother that the government has an order not to cure Uyghur patients, let them die. So the, it is so hard to get, to get admitted to hospital right now. Even if you got admitted, basically they just get your money, but they don't give, give you the right treatment to cure your illness. So the, the, the Uyghur people are dying a lot by a very large number uh, because there's nobody on the ground uh, from the international community China doesn't allow any foreigners in East Pakistan. They even kicked out Pakistani students from Urumqi. And uh, they don't allow foreigners there. They don't allow cameras. All the cameras are forbidden in East Pakistan. They, nobody can take pictures about Uyghur people. So uh, the situation is so bad, but the international community don't know about that. And it's getting worse and worse. We are heading to that numbers. The number I just... Uh, Co quoted uh, one third, one third, one third. There are about 20 million Uyghurs by our count. The Chinese government said recently, by the end of 2018, uh, there, there, there were about uh, 12 million Uyghurs. But uh, <clears throat> the population number of the minorities is also a top secret in China, state secret. They don't give out the real number. Just like everything else, China lies about everything else. Uh, Pompeo just pointed out recently, when it comes to China, distrust, distrust and verify. It's the same situation. Um, <clears throat> there is a video from a retired army general in the US. Uh, he, he, talk, he gave a presentation somewhere. He, he mentions, he, is, he linked to the CIA. Um, and he says, uh, there are 20 million Uyghurs in, in Xinjiang. So our population 20 million. So if you look at one third, one third, one third, we are talking about seven million. In, on September 23rd, uh, 2018, Al Jazeera TV had an interview uh, with uh, Nuri Turkel, uh, one lawyer in the US, and, uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, another person, um, Victor Gao. He's the, he's the vice chairman of a Chinese think tank. Uh, also, he, he was a translator to Deng Xiaoping when Deng Xiaoping visited the U.S. in 1970s. He said in the TV, I still have the YouTube video, that altogether there are six or seven million Uyghurs. He said this in September 2018. So China already planned, planned to keep only like a six or seven million Uyghurs, get rid of the rest. That is the reality. The unfortunate situation is if you look at most of the, the Western media, they still say more than 1 million Uyghurs have been detained. That's not true. That number was true in January, January of 2018. There's an article on that one. This is well, 800,000 to, 1, 800, to 1 million Uyghurs were detained, but the people still using the same number. The size of the concentration camps doubled, tripled since then. And the China is still building new camps, new prisons right now. 
and still detaining new people. I, I, got, I got information recently. Everywhere, they're detaining new people. And it's very hard to make, the, make up the quota. The government is issuing quota to each uh, police station's police unit to, to detain how many people. And they are having a hard time to find those people because they are all gone, especially in cities, towns, villages. All the big or small cities is empty now. Uh, this is the current situation. And uh, because, because lack, lack of uh, reporters on the ground and the uh, UN or other so the international, international institutions didn't send any observer or investigator, and the China is carrying out their plan, their master plan. Recently, I learned the CCP regime had three plans, plan A, plan B, plan C. And they tried plan A and succeeded. So they didn't need to try plan B and C. And uh, about a month ago, the Xi Jinping held a Xinjiang meeting in, in, in Beijing. And uh, he said there that uh, all the policies put in place in Xinjiang are correct and we will pursue it forever. So uh, people think that there is an international pressure built up right now against the Chinese regime, but it is not working. And they just declared to the world that what we are doing is right and we will continue. Meaning what they are, what they are doing in Xinjiang is right. They will continue the same policy. And that's the situation. People wow. Like, people, yeah. people, people like me, I lost sleep. I lost smile. I don't. I cannot smile anymore. I cannot watch YouTube uh, or video because whenever I open it, I start crying. The everything we know about Uyghur land, we were we were homeland is gone. Uyghur people are not allowed to live with their language, custom, culture. They all forbidden. And now the Chinese government teaching Han Chinese the Uyghur dances and Uyghur songs. Do you know why? because there, there's not going to be any Uyghurs there. So in the future, when the visitors go to Tors, go to East Turkestan, they still see Uyghur dances and sing so, songs, but performed by Han Chinese, not by Uyghur. So, so China is attempting to, to wipe out the, the minority populations of, of China and, and replace them essentially, as you're saying, or assimilate them into the, the Han Chinese group. Um, like why? Why do they think this is is necessary? Like, w what is it about the, the 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 Han Chinese that makes them believe that, that? Or what is it to do with their plan that means they have to murder yes. and uh, sort of co-opt any kind of culture, yes. erase any opposition or anyone that's even slightly different? Like that. That's that's horrifying. Like, what is their what is their end game? What's their goal? Yeah, yeah let me explain that to you. I have, done, uh, I have did some research trying to formulate the problem uh, why China is trying to eradicate Uyghur race. Why now? There are seven main reasons. The one reason is Belt Road Initiative. I think you know, know, know this project. It's a huge project uh, related to 70, more than 70 countries in the world. There are three main um, land routes for this project. The one starts from Xi'an and it passes through East Turkestan. Other two main routes starts from East Turkestan. Its, its starting point is our homeland. And one uh, goes from our homeland to Pakistan, Gwadar port. That's the main uh, one, main um, uh, commerce route, commercial route for China. Another one goes to Central Asia and from Central Asia go to Europe. So the Road Belt Initiative is a huge project uh, China designed to, to dominate the world. And the three main routes pass through or starts from our homeland. So to be successful in this project, China uh, needs a very stable region in East Turkestan. And they sought Uyghurs a factor of instability because they tried 70 years almost to assimilate the Uyghur people and they couldn't do it. So what they are doing right now is a final solution. They, they want to eradicate the Uyghur people and achieve stability in, in East Turkestan so that they are successful in, in road, 
on belt initiator. That's the one, number one reason. Number two reason is China's uh, concern about <clears throat> China's concern about the war between the between China and the U.S. There, there are some uh, meetings I, I learned in the U.S. about the, some strategic plan, how to destabilize China from inside. And they thought about the Uyghur people. Uyghur people is the, 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 the main uh, uh, advantageous factor for that. The, the retired general talks about that uh, thing too. And uh, the China thought that one day, if, if China goes to war with the US, US can easily arm 300 to 500,000 Uyghur people, young, strong Uyghur people in East Turkestan and those people will fight alongside the U.S. against China. There is a uh, Chinese general. It's also, he's also an advisor to the Central Army Committee. He's a professor at the China, China National Defense University. Uh, he has a lecture given in 2011. He talks about the subject. He says, China is saying terrorist is the main reason, main um, uh, threat to our country, but it's not. It is the Uyghur people. The Uyghur people has a huge population um, in Kashgar and Hotan, and uh, like 95% of those regions are Uyghurs. And he says this, if China goes to war with the US, the can, US can easily arm 300 to 500 young Uyghur men, and they will fight against China. I will use my power to solve this problem. This is what he said in 2011. So what you see right now, he is solving the problem. The first round of the detention took place in mostly in Kashgar, Hotan, 500,000 young men. They were all taken to Han provinces starting in 2000, early 2018, day and night by train. And those 500,000 young men, all are male, very strong, healthy, and religious. They were taken in the first phase. So this is number two reason. Number three reason is, China has a needs for land and resources, but not for human population. You know, China is overpopulated. They have more than enough of population. And uh, when it comes to minority, they don't need the people. They don't need the minority people. They need their land and resources. The same thing is true with us. We are about 20 million uh, population. For China, it's nothing. It's a, it's a census error, actually. China has a census era between 10 to 20 million. We are that small in China. So if you are, we disappear, it means nothing for them. That's why they don't care if the Uyghur people die. They are, they are happier actually if they can get rid of more people uh, in, in East Turkestan. So this is number three reason. Number four is the opportunity. China worked for, for a long time for these days. The, the, the thing they did is they, uh, they they basically bought out uh, many foreign governments with the economic opportunity or investment. And uh, they chose this time, uh, thinking that uh, no, they can do this, and the international community will stay silent. And uh, that's the case we are seeing. So they had this opportunity. They are strong economically. So uh, the Islamic world, Turkish world, Western world, all got bought out by the by Chinese government. And when this is happening, like uh, we are, uh, I have a Twitter account. I put out uh, news every day. I get um, um, many, most information from, from our homeland directly. What's happening there? Nobody cares. It is happening. The world is watching. It's, not, it's happening. So the so number four reason is the opportunity. Number five is the nature of Han people's culture. I mentioned to you a little bit earlier. There is a lecture given by an IU agent, a professor at Nankai University. And he says, the main character of the Chinese, Han Chinese people is, is the assimilation. We assimilate the good races and keep them, but we eradicate the bad ones. So he says this to an army class at Nankai University. So that's why I said earlier that the uh, Chinese government says there are 56 uh, minority groups uh, in, in China but they are gone. They all assim got assimilated. This professor mentions that too. They, they assimilated most of the minorities already. 
The number six, uh, is has something to do with the Chinese rulers, historically, even today. The Chinese rulers are very get used to kill large number of people. They, if you look at uh, uh, 2000 years ago, in uh, tw uh, tw 215 BC, the Chen Shi Huang, they, I don't know if you know him or not, is the person who unified seven countries in China and uh, made, uh, gave birth to the current, current China. In, in 215 BC. At the last war, he captured 10,000 prisoners of, of war, prisoners of the war, and he orders to kill all of them. There's a YouTube documentary on that one. The recent one, the only cultural revolution, Mao Zedong ordered to kill the large portion of the Chinese population. And the people estimate about 30 to 60 million Chinese population died between 1965 to 1975, during the Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong gave order to kill. It's, it didn't happen by accident. And in our region, I can tell you many uh, incidents, massacres happened after 1949. In each incident, uh, we, lo we lost about 10,000 people. The latest one is in 2014 in Yaken. Three villages were flattened in one night. Another one in 2017, another three villages were flattened in Korla Prefecture in one night. What they do, they, they build human wall, three walls in circle, like a three kilometers, five kilometers, 10 kilometers. The order coming from the government is even don't allow one bird to fly out from the area. They just lock down the whole area, flatten the village, next day you see nothing. The people and the houses, everything's gone. One, <clears throat> one uh, Chinese army member who participated in the Yakan uh, massacre, little he came out to abroad and he, he talked about that. Do you know what he said? He said he killed the people, buried them, flattened the houses, and they built trees on, on that land during the night. So today, there are villages, houses, people, next day is flat, with the new, newly planted trees. This is how China does things. Because they don't allow any foreigners, any reporters, any cameras, and any outsiders, as I said, they build human wall before doing this kind of operation. They finish in one night, this kind of thing. The world doesn't know about that. Nobody talks about it. So it happened to us again and again. So this is number six reason. Uh, China does not care about uh, human life. To kill, to, they are willing to, to do mass killing secretly. Uh, they call, it, uh, call this operation as the lock the door and hit the dog. First, you lock the door, keeping the, keeping the dog inside, and you hit the dog so, so that nobody can hear about it. This is their tactic. This is number six. Number seven, I just uh, read recently uh, in some articles that uh, China is planning to uh, direct two rivers from Tibet to East Turkestan and convert the East Turkestan to China's California. This is in the article. Uh, people doing proposal and doing research, feasibility studies right now about this. And uh, what this means is China is wanted to convert East Turkestan, no Uyghur land, get rid of all the Uyghur land. And that article says they are planning to move more than 200 million population. So this is number seven. So these are the reasons why China wants to eradicate the Uyghur people and why they want to do now. Both the opportunities came, they did a very good preparation for that and they anticipated the current silency from the world and they're getting it. It's happening right now. So I, I, I understand that the, some of the parts of the world being um, just silent on this due to, to, to China's economic help through and partially through parts of the, the Belt and Road Initiative, as you mentioned. But, but as you also said, the, the weaker people could be... Uh, or, or in China's view anyway, at least, uh, or weakness if there's a, a future war between China and, and the United States or the West or, or just 
if China decides to yeah, go to war with the NATO or anyone, that the Uyghur people are seen as a, a weakness. And should, should that not mean that the, the West and, and the developed world and the free world should be even more concerned with, with this? Because it's kind of an indication that, that China anticipate war and and uh, I'm still like just shocked. Like I mean, I was aware that it was going on, but when when you lay it out like that, it's 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 stunning, stunning that that nothing has been said really about this. I mean, uh, this is the reason that that the um, like the Allies went to war against against Hitler was because he was he was. I don't even think they were aware of 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 the the extent to which hitler was was killing people like as far as i was aware that like early in the war especially um before he had started his final solution it was it was literally even just the idea that that there that they were promoting like one race above the above others we didn't even know really like the extent to which he had started to kill or or had was planning to kill the jewish people and and yet here we are sat not saying anything and and not imposing huge sanctions against against China for for doing something that like I'm taught at school is is the worst thing that ever happened in history. <laughs> I mean, it's probably got some some competitors in in history, especially by the signs of you know Chinese rulers that you you've listed there that that have killed a lot of people, but. Yeah. yeah, I'm just I'm stunned at the 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 lack of reaction from from nations that haven't been bought off. Like, why do you think the, for example, Europe or or NATO or or America haven't haven't come out and said you cannot do this or we will like invade essentially? Like that that seems like where it should be at with the the level of 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 death and destruction that's going on. Yes, um, it is true the. The assumption that uh, if China and the U.S. goes to war, the Uyghur will help. Um, Uyghurs will help U.S. It's an assumption. It is just like a, a one woman. Uh, some woman got pregnant, and uh, the government says, "Okay, if you give birth, give birth to this child, she, uh, he or she will become a killer. So let us get rid of them now, when when they are still in the stomach." Uh, it is the same thing that uh, what the Chinese government is doing to the Uyghur people. Uh, it's an assumption, and uh, carried out carrying out this kind of operation. Um, yeah, the, the 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 world does not understand China and the Ch Chinese rulers. That's the main problem. I earlier I said the Chinese government bought out many governments around the world. When they bought out governments, they don't bought out the whole government. They they bought out they buy out the top leaders basically. They put money in the pocket. They have other ta tactics too. Uh, if you do a little bit of research, you will know this. Uh, so the thing is, uh, I think the, there is no a, there is no willingness to get look into this problem. What's happening to Uyghur people? Just looks like the twenty million Uyghurs, and the, we are we are called we are Muslims, and then, as you know, the many Western countries don't care about Muslims that much. But the thing. In our case, I call ourselves a political Muslims because the China never allowed us to, to practice our religion. I, I didn't learn a single verse in, in school. I, grew, I was born and grew up in that land, but I didn't learn anything at school about religion. My daughter learned more religion in the, U, in the U.S. school. The one time when she was at the seventh or eighth grade, I uh, brought back a book social studies book, and I looked at it, it had the one chapter on Islam. I was almost cried, because we never had education like that back home. This is our situation. But the, the many, many countries in the West, just the, right now, the old reporters love to call us Uyghur Muslims. It is, it is a very bad label to us. Um, that label alone, uh, is causing a very huge damage to us. And in reality, I, I laid out um, seven reasons for you today why China is, is trying to eradicate the Uyghur people. There's no religion in it because the China is doing the same thing to Buddhists, 
Christians and uh, all other religions as well inside China. Uh, so the, the, the Chinese government brought out the leaders, on the, including the UN. The UN is horrible. The UN is completely lost its functionality. Uh, it's nothing left right now. You see, they recently the, the Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, government representative was in the UN Human Rights Council and they were discussing the human rights in the US. China is evaluating the human rights in the US. Just happened a couple of weeks ago. This is crazy. It's a practical joke, basically. This is how the, the world changed right now. And uh, yeah, in our case, it's unfortunate. And we are telling what we know, what we learned to the world, but the world don't care about that. By the time they care and send someone in to East Turkestan, the job is all, was already done. Just the same thing as, as, a, uh, as, a, as Jewish people in World War II, during World War II. Nobody listened. And then when they went in and they found out what happened, same thing is happening to us. Uh, it is very tragic. Uh, the 20 million population is not that big to the world, but it is everything for us. And uh, I don't know how many relatives I lost because my communication was cut off since 2017, January. I don't know anything about my like, extended families. This is the situation, and we cannot communicate. We cannot call, we cannot send email, or send text messages, we cannot. We are living in a station like this. All the Uyghurs are abroad right now. And the world know about that, and nobody cares. The world changed so much in the, in the last couple of decades. It is so amazing. Uh, we are still learning right now uh, from the US election how much the world changed. The Uyghur people also became a victim for that kind of situation. We are becoming the victim of such a situation. So do you think that, that um, the America and Britain um, are, are really scared to, to confront China on this? Are, are they, uh, do they feel like they can? Do they feel scared of, of, of what China are capable of? Like, it is mainly economic, economic interest. The US is doing the most and we are very grateful. Uh, they, they came up with a, a law bills about the war and punishing the uh, some Chinese government officials. We are doing very aggressively some uh, good jobs for us. But the thing is, the thing is, it's not stopping China. Uh, China declared again that uh, what we are doing is right and we will continue. So this, this kind of pressure is not working. The, I only uh, think that uh, there are hope in two things. One is when the communist Chinese regime come down and a democratic uh, system is established there. We have hope, this is the number one. Number two is the international institutions should be rebuilt and they should send independent observers and the station in East Turkestan to see what firsthand what's happening there. Unless this two, one of those two things happens, the the Uyghur peoples are continuously being victimized. We are losing thousands of people every day. It is continuing. And the whole Uyghur nation right now um, living on the, in, in fear, traumatized basically. Uh, you cannot find normal people anymore. Wow, that's pretty stunning. So what do you, what, what do you think it would take to, to, to stop China? Like what is... What does the international community need to do um, in order, like, w what sort of pressure would they listen to? Yeah, the most important thing is the international community should realize that uh, China is heading to dominate the world. It is their, their master plan. The road built initiative is designed for that, so that the China becomes the ruler of the world. But if China becomes the ruler of the world, the world will be very different. It is not somewhere that you want to live. It is very different. It's going to be very different from what it is now. The world should recognize this. And uh, I mentioned a little bit how we can solve this problem. 
<coughs> the current international um, uh, establishments don't, don't work anymore because they bought out. Like, like UN, UN is a, is a tool for China. Uh, WHO is a, is a tool for China. The World Trade Organization, WTO, is a, is a tool for China. Every this, uh, international establishment became a tool for China right now. China can do anything with them. Uh, so the, the world needs to wake up. Basically, needs to wake up and to turn the wave. Otherwise, the current um, trend is very dangerous. Yeah, the Uyghur people, 20 million, we may disappear. But the thing is, it's, the whole world is under threat right now from the Chinese regime. The world should recognize it. So the solution, I think, to reestablish the international institutions in the way what happened after World War II. At that time, the international institutions meant something. They could do some jobs, good jobs, after World War II. But it's not happening now. As I said, China is evaluating U.S.'s human rights records. What is that? Why are you putting five, five plus million people in the concentration camps and jails just because they are Uyghurs? What kind of war is this right now? The, so uh, again, just the two things. One is the runs the get of the Chinese regime, current communist Chinese regime. That's the one solution. The other one is rebuild the international institutions to, to overlook the human rights situation in the world humanity in the world. Otherwise, we are hidden in a very dark era. I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really stunned that, that nothing has happened thus far on this. I, yeah, I, I really, really hope that, that I, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to process that, that uh, our governments that are meant to stand for you know that's that's the reason they claim to have went to to war in Iraq was was for freedom and and liberty, uh, and like that's that's the justification they use for for going to war. And yet when we when we see an example um, like examples of of just the worst treatment of 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 like a group of people that I can possibly imagine, like did you said three thousand students disappeared that were that had known you just just gone? Yes, yes. The last one, I went back in 2009. I can, I can show you one picture. Um, I went back home in 2009 and I met the students. At that time, I got permit from the government. Uh, if I can go to, go to the um, campuses um, to meet the students. This is, this is one, one scene in Xinjiang University from 2009 and the government gave me permission they told me you can go to campuses and you meet with students take pictures okay but don't go to classrooms don't go to meeting halls give presentations i i give presentations every year around the world in two things one is in my, in my major in my field space telescopes and as one is uh, about like uh, what i do in nasa uh, also some uh, personal development uh, titles. So uh, when I went to uh, Ur Urumqi in 2009, I had a one, one presentation approved by NASA on my field. And that one is the regular uh, personal development. What, how I did. I am an Uyghur, born, grew up in that land. And uh, I went to school, all the school in Uyghur language system. My first four languages is Chinese. Later on, I learned English and Japanese. I spoke four languages. I could teach in four languages at universities. So the people are get interested in who, who learn. So they gave me permission. I went to schools and took pictures like this. This is uh, a um, <clears throat> question and answer session. Basically, they said, how did you study when you, when you were a student? Second one is, what we should prepare if you want to study abroad? Third one is, what do you do in NASA? Just the three questions. And uh, you see, this happened in 2009. And just last year, I learned that uh, I, when I went to Xinjiang University, this was during the weekdays. It's a, it's a morning, the weekdays. I was expecting five to 10 students, but ended up almost 300 students at campus. And I learned uh, very, this year that uh, before I went to Xinjiang University, 
the, the authorities worked for two days installing cameras on the trees. This is a lake, the, the, the short, short lake is where I went. And they got, the official put cameras on the trees. And they, they made preparation for two days and they took videos, all the students. And when I left, many of them couldn't graduate. But starting in 2017, meeting with me, communicating with me became a crime. Because the government issued quota saying, well, this week from this area, you have to detain 500 people. So they look for 500 people. So one crime is the meeting with Eric and Sadiq and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, taking pictures or communicating with Eric and Sadiq by, by email. Uh, let me tell you one more story. Um, that uh, I learned recently that about a person, uh, his name is also Eric and Sadak. Uh, he went to abroad. He was arranged by, by uh, he was a teacher at a vocational school in Urumqi. And um, his school selected up seven people to, to tour abroad, Malaysia uh, and uh, Singapore, those countries. The government organized them. They went there for three, two weeks and they came back. But when they came back to, the, to, to Beijing, he was arrested because his name is Erkin Sadak. And the lead of the group is Han Chinese, the school officials. And they, he said, I testify, he's not an Erkin Sadak in the US. This is a school teacher of our school. He's a very good guy. That's why we selected him to, to go to this tour. And the police says, it's not none of your business. They detained him for three days and uh, released him uh, three after that. The police came to, this is not his picture, by the way. I tried to get his picture, but I couldn't get it because people were so scared. They went, people went to the school asking about him. Everybody, when they hear his name, so scared, ran away. Nobody gave it his picture. And uh, he was taken back to Urumqi, died one week later. He's 50 years old only, and he died because he has a name of Erkin Sadak. And uh, this, this guy, this, this guy, <clears throat> Nurmamat Mutalib, came to, to the US in 2000, got two master degrees in business administration. His dad is a businessman in, in East Turkestan, very rich, billionaire. And uh, his, he came to the US and uh, got two master degree, and he, he had these two kids. And after graduation, he went back. His dad, his dad asked him to come back and serve his people. He went back. He was detained in January of 2018 and released in October, but died nine days later. 42 years old. Do you know why? Look at his body. He is young, strong, we were men. He is in the category of one day will fight with the with, uh, with, with U.S. against China. That kind of guy. This is what they are doing to people like him. And uh, let me show you one more picture. A red shirt. I had Aman. <clears throat> red shirt. I had Aman my middle school literary teacher. He became a school principal after that, like 20 years, around 20 years. He got detained in 2018. At the age of 78, he retired long ago, but detained and it died uh, about four months later in, in the concentration camp. This is what China is doing. I can go on and go on like this. The China is not re-educating people. They are getting rid of them. The final goal, to change the Uyghur land to, to, uh, to no Uyghur land, this is their goal. They are doing it every day right now. So why do they, why, why do they target you as, as, a, as a professor? Is it, because, is it because you work for NASA or is it because you've just been an example of someone who successfully left um, a Xinjiang uh, or that area and and you know made made like a 
like had a had a really successful career and and life is that is do they not want people to see that that's a that's a possibility or is it your work with yeah, nasa yeah. or yeah that's that's it is my influence and uh, i am an inspiration for younger people um i did very well when i was there before i went i went abroad um in in my undergraduate year five year the first year we learned chinese and in other two years, I learned English and the Japanese on my own. At that time, nobody could do that. When I started learning English, uh, people ma- ma- um, made laugh. Or, uh, people, people laughed at me, saying, oh, you cannot do that, kind of. But I did. And uh, I did very well academically in my coursework. And I was also a student uh, leader. I was the president of the uh, Xinjiang University Student Association for four years. So I was, I was in the propaganda a lot. Uh, I am an inspiration for young people. So I went to Japan, after that came to US and uh, worked in Silicon Valley, later joined NASA. And I wrote a lot of articles about um, personal development, um, uh, child, child care, religion, and that goal setting, uh, many different subjects in Uyghur. Uh, basically, I sometimes converted one book into one article, one good book in the Western um, countries into a good Uyghur article. Basically, I, I imported knowledge to, to Uyghur land. And uh, so the China is, is kind of worried about me, my influence, basically. So uh, after 2009, they didn't give me any visa to visit my homeland. In, 2015, there was an international conference in Beijing about space technology. Uh, they invited me to give an um, uh, invited speaker speech, speech, and I accepted that. The reason I wanted to use that chance to get a visa to go to, go to China and visit my relatives, but they denied visa again. Um, that's the reason, that's because I'm an inspiration for young people. You see. The China want to get it off to other people, and I want to. I, I'm trying to make them stronger, survive. So I'm doing the opposite of the Chinese government. That's why they didn't like me. It's very admirable what you're doing. I have a lot of respect for for you to try and. I mean, it's easy for people to preach um, the importance of 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 free speech and expression and and the sharing of of knowledge and information in the in in britain or in america it's it's you know well i mean it's maybe becoming a little harder with facebook's crackdown on on free speech but i mean it's it's very easy for for us to like defend those those liberties by typing it on like a blog or something or on twitter or but to to actually be involved in in that fight and in some something where you're 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 putting yourself at at risk is 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 uh is really inspiring uh, it's I, 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 yeah, I've got a lot of respect for, for, for everything you've done there in, in that case and, and for continuing to speak out about it because um, it's at the cost of, of not being able to, as you, as you said, see your family. And that's, uh, that's never something that anyone w- wants to even consider putting on the table. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I have I've, I've a lot of respect for, for your, your commitment to, to this. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really inspiring. Thank you so much. So, uh, do, uh, yeah, do, do, do you think that we have a chance to, to, to defeat authoritarian China? Like, can, is, is that like a, a situation you're optimistic of? The, the China, China's rulers are very complicated. Um, the, many people don't get them, don't understand them. But uh, the world should try. As I said earlier, if, if, we don't, if, if the world does not solve China's problem, the whole world is in danger. If you, if you look back now and uh, analyze and, uh, and make, a, uh, make an observation of the, the whole world in the last two to 300 years, the Western countries built a civilization in the last um, several centuries, very wonderful advanced civilizations. And the China is destroying every one of them. Every one of them. You say you have a great system in the West and the China can find a loophole and take advantage of that and starting to destroy it. 
Everything you have in the Western countries right now, look at it. This is what's happening. The China is a very different country, very different from all other countries in the world. And uh, they have 2,000 years old theory, tactics, measures uh, to achieve what they want to achieve. And they are doing that. It's very complicated. The U.S. finally started to understand, some people in the U.S., but in a lot of other countries, uh, they are still panda, pa panda huggers. Panda huggers, when they say China, they just think about the panda. <laughs> but in reality, it is completely different. So uh, this is not just a real problem, as I said. Uh, I don't know if it can survive or not, uh, but uh, I am trying. The last year, um, this is my several friends, I founded a, a Uyghur Projects Foundation in the US. It's a registered nonprofit organization. The goal is to try to save Uyghur language, culture, and identity abroad, because we lost everything back home. The Uyghur cultures are wonderful. It is very attractive, <clears throat> and they contributed greatly to world civilization. We should not disappear like this. Uh, but uh, the real problem is still a small problem as compared to the whole world. The world should to try to stop China for their own good. Otherwise, the world is heading to a very bad direction. If you look carefully about what's happening recently, everything is influenced by China. All the bad things, terrorism, the Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Iran, North Korea, just look around. Every best in Iran, every best in China is involved with them. China is helping them out. And they're calling us the terrorists. So the world needs to wake up, do something for their own good. Well, I feel like that's that's a pretty solid point to leave it on. I mean, people need to to realize that the, the horrors of the occurred in the the in history um, are, are not confined to history um, and people are, are capable of, of some awful things as the Chinese government are, are obviously, yeah, very, very complicit and, and, and active in, in yeah, genocide. You can't call it anything else. Um, so I think it's important for people to, to, to make sure we remember that and, yeah, not forget it or, oh, well, yeah. You may regret it. So yeah, uh, thanks, thanks very much, Doctor Sidik. It's, it's been a, a really eye-opening conversation. Thank you very much for the opportunity as well. Thanks so much for listening. If you haven't already and you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast and to our mailing list. And don't forget, my book Brexit: The Establishment Civil War is now available for pre-order on Amazon. You'll find the link in the description below. Until next time, thanks so much for listening.